So we also wish Rajdeep all the best uh, for today and for his coming years. Of course, he set the tone for tonight. We're going to be talking about media in the age of mistrust. There used to be a point in time when, like how Rajdeep said, that the journalists were a little wary of the PR industry, and now I guess the PR industry is a little wary of the journalists. <laughs> this is what's probably going on right now. And we've got a robust panel talking about the various nuances of media as we experience it today. Risk, reputation, brand building, effective communication. Of course, as far as journalism itself is concerned, the divide which is happening, literally. So uh, I'm going to be calling out um, the names of our panelists here tonight. Request you all to please come and um, these are fancy, nice bar stools for you all. <laughs> we don't want you to be too comfortable because we want you to come back and party with us here uh, on the floor. All right. Uh, with a loud round of applause, may I invite my first panelist on stage, Ms. Pooja Patak, co-founder and director, Media Mantra. A successful entrepreneur with immense creativity and business acumen, which assists her to undertake diverse roles in life, including being a businesswoman, a lecturer, and a mother of two lovely kids. I think that really kind of requires a loud round of applause to be handling home and professions. And now we need to be imparting this knowledge to the men folk as well, I guess. Mr. Bhubendra Chaube. TV journalist since 2000, from NDTV to CNN and IBN, has covered three general elections as a political journalist, now hosts a weekend show, Hot Seat, writes for various Hindi and English publications, both online and offline. Thank you, Mr. Chaube, for taking the time for being here. Ms. Vibha Bhakshi, a national award-winning filmmaker, acknowledged by the President of India for the best film on social issues. She's also made films for the United States government and HBO, both of which have been highly acclaimed. Vibha's also studied journalism and broadcasting from Bo the Boston University and New York University. Thank you, Vibha, for, the ta for taking the time for being here tonight. Our, um, our moderator, Kumar D. Banerjee, who heads external communication for Vodafone, looking uh, into stakeholder engagement for reputational brand management. Prior to this, he's been a broadcast journalist with Z, Archtak, and Bloomberg TV. Thank you. Ex-colleagues, yes. Uh, and last but definitely not the least, can we hear it out loud for Mr. Sharif Rangnekar, Chairman Integral PR, a former journalist and researcher. Sharif has led the firm as its CEO for over 10 years and taken over as its chairman in 2015. Um, amongst other things, of course, we all know Sharif personally, but I don't know how many of us do know he's associated with uh, an initiative, I Am Who I Am, and also uh, a band, Friends of Linger. He sings as well, and he's raising his voice for the LGBT community as far as India is concerned. Can we hear it out loud for Sharif? All yours, 45 minutes, Kumar Deep. Uh, please do keep at least 10 minutes for this wonderful audience to pose some questions to you. All yours. All right. Thank you. Is the mic working now? Yeah, fine. Thank you, Subarna, for that wonderful uh, sort of an introduction that saves, takes away about five minutes from the introduction which I had set out. So very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for making it through uh, this traffic-filled Delhi evening, which is a common feature in the central part of Delhi. Thank you for all being here. Thank you, uh, Exchange for Media Events. Thank you, Superna, for getting an eclectic mix of ladies and gentlemen under and putting them under the spotlight this evening to discuss one of the most crucial existential angst that has hit humankind ever since the general elections in the one of the most prosperous democracies in the world. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> not that dramatic, but yeah. Uh, as Rajdeep was mentioning, today we discuss something what Denzel Washington had once said that if you uh, uh, subscribe to the media, you are uninformed. And if you, do if you do not subscribe to the media, you are uninformed. If you do not subscribe to the media, then you are misinformed. So media in the age of 
mistrust is what we are going to discuss and we have a whole host of experiences uh, right here under the spotlight and we carry forward our what we call the bar side chat because this is not a fireside chat so we'll go ahead with our bar side chat and Suparna and rest of you some of you are far bigger authorities sitting right there at the back on the topic at hand and on the switching of narratives, the shifting of narratives, the shifting media scape, the bipolarity, the polarities in the world that we are seeing right now. So we will have ample time for question and answer. Superna, please be the timekeeper. If any of us tend to exceed that 45 minutes window, do raise your hand or do throw away, throw some of those stuff that, that you could find near you. So without it, without much ado, uh, Opening remarks from our fellow panelists. Should I go left? Should I go right? I don't know which one. But let me go with you, Sharif. So Sharif has got some interesting takes on mistrust and media. So let's hear you. Uh, let, me, let me put in a, a, a question towards your opening remarks. Do you think a good amount of mistrust is actually good for business? Maybe you can tackle it as well. So I really don't think mistrust is good for business. Uh, mistrust might be good for certain media houses, I think, you know, to, to mislead people. And uh, due respect, uh, I think, I think the, the thing is that we're taking up this topic perhaps a little, uh, it's a good topic to take up and that too at a PR forum, uh, because invariably the trust aspect, as Rajdeep said, uh, has been questionable when it comes to the PR industry for a long time. And even today, I think there are a lot of journalists who don't trust PR people. But I think the biggest problem is really not in PR. Because uh, I think as an industry, we, uh, the clients that we represent uh, stand for scrutiny. I mean, they are up for scrutiny. Uh, we engage directly with the press. We engage with other consumer groups, uh, stakeholders, etc. But I think the story of mistrust of, uh, uh, as far as uh, the press goes, goes back a long way. And I think many of you all would remember an ad campaign from one of the largest newspapers in the, wor uh, in the world, actually, in English, which compared a newspaper with the, pr the price of a newspaper with a samosa. I think at that time itself, the press itself started to relook at itself as what it was. A leading uh, promoter of, of the same group stands up and compares a newspaper with a fast-moving consumer group, uh, a, a consumer good, which is basically saying it's like a soap, it's like shampoo, etc. So I think the dumbing down of press itself started long ago, and perhaps we didn't notice it, you know. And uh, if you if we look at even the current uh, situation, uh, as Rajdeep also pointed out, you're seeing a polarization, you know, where certain press believe they're nationalists, certain press believes they're anti-national, or they're being termed anti-national. Uh, there are press where, you, as you just said, should I look left, should I look right? So, you know, that ideology is another problem that uh, the press is facing. So I think the, the issue for PR is much easier today as far as trust and representing brands, but I think the problem lies really and resides mostly with the press who today is owned by corporations, and while there might be Chinese walls, but we all know Chinese walls, is, I mean, the Chinese wall is not a wall. And uh, so we don't know where that, that gray area is perhaps a challenge for us to address, but in terms of credibility, it's for the press to really sort that out. Well, thank you, Sharif, for those opening remarks. They are uh, pretty cogent. Should I turn to Bhubendra to, do you want to directly take that on, or do you, do, should I go uh, with the ladies and... and, and uh, your okay. For your opening uh, remarks as well. Sure. Am I audible? Am I, audible? I don't think you're audible. Do you want a mic? And this is one of those rare moments when uh, you are being subjected to a moderation <laughs> and not audible. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think maybe there's a problem with my frequencies. Okay, this is, this is fine. No, firstly, uh, thanks to the organizers uh, of this event. Lovely place, last place to be having an intellectual, intelligent conversation since the bar is right in front. Yeah, the bar side chat. Yeah, it's a bar side chat. But since the topic is such, and since uh, Sharif is, uh, has, has set up this debate uh, in, frankly, if I may say so, very predict predictable manner, all points uh, which he's raised are points which have existed before the press for a very long time. And the fact that this debate has been kick-started by a journalist pontificating about what the PR industry is all about 
also tells us a lot about uh, about the times that we live in. So firstly, let's be honest about the reality of the times that we live in. Uh, I have a lot of friends in the PR industry and truth be told, Sharif, uh, over the last seven to eight years, some of the best stories that I've done have all come from the PR sector. So huge round of applause Woo! to all of you. Uh, because, because I do believe a lot of my colleagues have actually switched over to, uh, to the PR profession. So I don't buy this theory for a moment that, uh, that, you know, there was a time when PR was being looked down upon and journalists were these great souls and PR people were, you know, were, were somewhere there. I don't buy that at all. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here. Uh, what I do believe, where this word mistrust has kind of got embedded with our industry, and I'm even willing to say that this is a huge opportunity before India as of today, where PR and press can frankly both coexist and cooperate with each other. I do not see anything wrong whatsoever with a representative from the PR fraternity coming to me and telling me about a story which, let's say, may be helping a certain client of his or may be against a certain client of an adversary, as long as the story is factual. As long as there is some merit and some depth, if it is backed by facts, if it's backed by documents, I'll go with the story. My job is not to look after your client's interests or the, the, Ill, or the interests of someone's adversaries. My job is to bring the information out. Now, if, to that extent, if the press will be called compromise, if the press will be called taking sides, then so be it. Our job is to bring out facts. Our job is to, uh, is to bring out a story. On the question of Chinese walls, on the question of um, corporate ownership, I've just turned 40 uh, uh, this month, uh, this year. And I have been around now for what? I started working with NDTV with my dear friend Shivraj sitting right there many, many years back. Uh, since the time I started working as a professional journalist till now, and even before when one, would be, when one would be hearing about the press and about the media, all these questions have been raised. If the allegation is that the press is compromised today, let me say press is always compromised. If the allegation is press has no credibility, let me say press has never had any credibility whatsoever. Having said all that, I think there is still enough scope, despite the restrictions, despite the pressures which Rajdeep very lucidly has pointed out, which are applicable in all of us. I think there is still scope, there is still opportunity in which all of us can discharge our responsibilities. And as much as I salute and compliment my friends in, and colleagues in the PR industry, similarly, I compliment all my friends and colleagues in the journalism space who, despite those pulls and pressures, still manage to put up some kind of a, of a reasonable product out there night after night. This challenge of whether you're right, whether you're left, what's your ideology, I face this challenge on a daily basis. I'm uh, what, just 48 hours back, uh, I'm, I'm looking at a scenario where a political party has, has sued us for supposedly towing the line of a party B, and the party B, 24 hours later, sues us for supposedly towing the line of party A. Now, if both these parties are upset, and if both these parties are going to accuse us of taking their sides, and I think that we're doing something right. Because our job is to ensure that both party A and party B are equally upset with us. Thank you, Bupind. That's an interesting conversation to have, and you have the round of applause to suggest what it means. We will park some of the uh, thoughts that you have raised there, and I'm sure our lovely audience, the informed audience that we have, has some questions. But let me turn to you, Viva, and you more from a civil society perspective, more from an observer perspective, though you are one of uh, fairly vocal content creator in this space. How do you look at uh, this entire media space? How do you look at the narratives which are being weaved around mistrust through various channels? First of all, uh, a big thank you to everyone for being here. I've just, uh, just landed from, well, just driven down from Haryana, where we've uh, started the sequel for our film, Daughters of Mother India. But I just want to say that as a documentary filmmaker, I will always be a struggling filmmaker. <laughs> the issues that we take up are going to be very sensitive. And the last one that we took up was on what happened to India after the night of Nirbhaya's rape and murder. I don't think I could have got into a more sensitive and a volatile zone. And the result has been that Besides the national award, which we are very grateful for, the film got embraced 
by the government, by the police, by the activists and academia. And I think there was a lesson to learn there, which was that even as a documentary filmmaker, you can create emotions that you have that ability to create emotions. And so you have to be very responsible. When this film came out, there was only, thing, there was only one thing that the team said, that we will make a responsible film. And if the intent and emotion is right, your viewer is very smart to understand it. We had gained access to the Delhi Police Control and Command Room, and I could have done whatever I wanted with the police. The quotes that I could have got would be similar to the other film that got released. It would have been sensational. I would have swept the international awards. At one point, I really thought nobody would watch Daughters of Mother India besides our families. But that's not what happened. And that's when I say, you've got to be true to yourself in whatever you do. Your viewers are smart enough to understand that. The film had no solutions. The film had no heroes or villains, and that's what we talk about. It doesn't have to be black or white. Leave it to the audience to derive what they want to out of it. And I think I am an extremely small part of what unleashed. You need the help, and that's where I bring up the public relations company. We could not have made a small film like Daughters of Mother India movement without Weber Shandwick, which is the PR company that supported us pro bono. And really a big round of applause to them because we could not have done this alone. And that's when I, I appeal to everybody that those who are in the position of power and influence, then do it the right way. Use it when you need to, because that's far more important than just branding. Thank you, Viva. That was, uh, that was very interesting because you alluded to what Rajdeep was saying, facts are sacred. And if you, if, you, if, if you have the right kind of intent, then facts are what it matters. But let me turn my attention to Pooja. Uh, and uh, you are a, a, a career communicator, as well as a mother of three, though uh, Suparna said mother of two. Having said that, uh, in the company. <laughs> okay, we will not create mistrust here. Uh, so tell us, uh, how does one manage reputation? What are the reputational risks and reputational management risks in an era of mistrust, something which you are passionate about? A very good evening to all of you present here. Um, I think today's discussion is something which is very alarming and it, and it is something which is very crucial considering the point of time and the point of hour that we are today in. There's no silver bullet solution to deal with this kind of a situation. But the only thing that has to be done in today's epoch of mistrust is that we need to prioritize our integrity and we need to start respecting our values. That's the first thing that we need to do as responsible individuals, and that's the first thing we need to do as responsible professionals. Not just that, the issue of mistrust is not in one industry. It is seen across the verticals, and it is seen across the sectors. You take the recent example of Tata and Cyrus. That's a clear-cut case of corporate mistrust. We take the example of surgical strikes. That's the case where we are today questioning our own army officers. This is completely uncalled for, and this is something which we have never done in so many years. I personally believe that the times of communication that we are today in, we can have insurance claim for everything, but we cannot have an insurance claim for reputation. So it is therefore important to handle reputation with a lot of care and with a lot of caution. Thank you, Pooja. Well said, well said. And there you have the teams clapping for you. Let me turn a uh, quick question to Bhupendra. Sorry. Uh, so there are these echo chambers which exist. And we are, we are somehow tired. We are part of the process. We are, we are somehow drawn into it. What Rajdeep was alluding to as surround sound of media. Do you think that uh, it's the birth of these echo chambers which is uh, keeping away the real narrative 
from emerging in front of, uh, of, of the audiences? Actually, what is a real narrative? Let, yeah. me, let me put that question on the table. What is reality? What you describe as an echo chamber, what a lot of uh, people around us uh, describe as a platform which thrives on anonymity, which thrives where reputations are assassinated on a daily basis, if not an hourly basis. For many, that's the reality. For many, the reality that we attempt to dish out on a daily basis on our news platforms is not the reality. It's a, it's a skewed version of a reality. So it depends on which side of the table you are really on. I think what has really happened and why you're having this debate and why you're using this word mistrust is because somewhere along the line, maybe because of, uh, because of the kind of spectacular growth that social media platforms have seen, maybe the fact that increasingly news increasingly gets broken on Twitter or Facebook, and more often than not, when it breaks on a social media platform, it turns out to be false. Uh, but because, because there are no checks and balances as such, you know, you want to say something about me, you can go, you can tag 20 people, you can say whatever you want to say about me. Uh, I want to say something about you, you know, uh, and let me just say this, that while I, you know, while I, I applaud and compliment my friends in, in the PR fraternity, manipulation of social media, manipulation of perceptions, as many of you would certainly know, itself has turned out to be a huge industry. I mean, you know, I don't want to take names here, but let me just say this, that uh, some friends of mine, they actually showed me. They actually showed me how Twitter trends can actually be manipulated. Now, someone is doing that, boss. You know, there are, there are professional teams out there which are, which are manipulating perceptions, or something that I'm describing as, as perception. As I said to many, that's a reality. And they say that what we dish out is a, is a perception. If I fall for that, then that's where, that's where my fault is. And I think that's where also the distinction between the so-called mainstream media and the so-called social media uh, really comes in, the new, new forms of media really comes in. Because at the end of the day, I think there is still some filters. They've been compromised, they've come down, quality may have come down. I'm always the first one to admit that, but I think it's still much better in comparison to where we are as far as social media platforms is concerned. And I think it will take some time, you know, before, before both these really come together. So this word mistrust will forever remain embedded with our, uh, with our industry, with our profession, till such time there is no equality of sorts between what is new age media and what is so-called so old world conventional media. Thank you, Bupendra. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I would like you to think upon one interesting bit. Has the world really changed uh, post the uh, general elections in US when we saw these echo chambers leading to what they did in a way? But we'll park that thought. But let me uh, turn to Sharif and perhaps Pooja and Vibha also. Uh, do you think it's the echo chambers as the social media is turning out to be, which is the real culprit for this mistrust? Or do you think there is uh, uh, a more manipulative agenda at play? And if, if the social media weren't there, there would have been something else. See, I think uh, Bupinder is right. I mean, there's perhaps a lot more manipulation that takes place because a lot of what flows around in social media is also word of mouth. And then if, if, if Bupendra is my friend and he posts something, I trust him. I might repost it, but I may not be able, I may not verify what he's posted. And a lot of that happens. But I think, any, you know, manipulation, just like he said, this whole uh, issue of credibility in the press or credibility of PR, they've been consistently uh, perhaps questionable for a long time. Um, uh, but I think the, the, the manipulation is, is, seems to be part of a certain kind of culture that we also live in, just like uh, was being saying the times that we're living in. And uh, because when you have ideologies also impacting, and I think it was, uh, if I remember, uh, Madan also, uh, Madan Behel of Ad Factors had tweeted when the US results came. And he made a tweet which had something to do with uh, you know, that the press in the US should have put its ideologies aside and reported the news or what was happening. And I think, so when you're looking at manipulation, it's not, it's not just in the US, but it's been happening here as well. When, when a large corporation that has also been, the name was mentioned, pulls out an ad, ad campaign or pulls out all of its ads from a newspaper and uses that as a tool to determine what stories also come, that's also manipulation. And that goes back a long time, so it's not today. Can 
can I, can I just add and can I really be blunt with this? I think the word mistrust uh, is being debated here in, in this manner simply because of this is one simple perception and there's one simple thought and I just want to put it very, very clearly. I'm, by the day, I'm getting more and more convinced that hatred in our society is getting institutionalized. Yeah. We love to hate each other. We don't love to love each other anymore. And that's why we love it. If I could be distrustful towards you, if I could find a reason to hate you, it'll keep me going. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's a very sad thought. I, I kind of... I, you know, I, there was an ad, I just want to add something please. because this whole thing of hate and with, without referring to which television program we're talking yeah, about. But this I'm is not, not television. No, no, but this I'm is, just saying... This yeah. has got nothing to do with TV no, or politics. But it's but the times we live in. Yeah, we yeah. were sitting in an ad agency, okay, right. one of the largest ad agencies, and they were debating this primetime TV news thing. And they said the most of people watch it...